Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Awake to Oneness Radio. I am Caroline Chang. I am your host. And Awake to Oneness Radio's mission is to inspire the world to awaken to oneness. Basically, awaken to the idea that we are all one, that we're all connected. Science and spirituality are telling us this, that we're literally connected. So basically what you do to another person you do to yourself. Um, And once the world awakens to the truth of oneness, there will be peace on earth. So my goal with this show is just to help inspire people to awaken to oneness. Today, the topic of our show is suicide from a spiritual perspective. This is the third show in a series of shows. Our guest today is author Anne Perrier, um, she is the author of Stephen Lives. Um, she wrote Stephen Lives, um, a wonderful book she wrote after her 15-year-old son Stephen took his own life. I discovered Anne um, while listening to the audio book Conversations with God, book three, um, um, while Neil Donald Walsh was talking about suicide in that book, he mentioned Anne and her book, and I contacted Anne right away, and I am so thankful and so honored that Anne is our my guest today. So I am going to bring Anne on. Uh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, Anne. Hi, Caroline. Hi, how are you? Oh, Thank I'm you. fine. Thank you so much for uh, being a guest on my new show, um, and I'm just so honored that uh, we've talked a couple of times, and I feel such a connection with you already, and I'm very honored for you. And to, I do um, with you, and I love what um, what you share is your truth and the oneness. I mean, that's what we're all about, too, so it was really nice to hear what you just said. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I do believe that, um, and I do believe once the world awakened to the fact that we're all one, you know, it, we'll, we'll be living in a, a totally different world. <laughs> so that's I agree 100%. <laughs> yes. So um, can you, um, like I said, I'm pretty, I haven't read the book. I do have your book, and that is going to be on my reading for this weekend. Um, but I do know a little bit about your story. If you could share in your own words um, your story and how you came to write the book, Stephen Liz? Well, my um, 15-year-old son, Stephen, was uh, not into drugs or alcohol. He was not clinically depressed. He was a good kid and just really the peacemaker of the family. Just, It's the most unlikely child to take their own life. Not that he didn't have his own things he was dealing with, but nothing of a serious nature, as is true of many suicides, uh, actually. But... Um, he he uh, hanged himself in the woods near our house on March um, a March day just before dusk, and he left a notebook with all kinds of notes in it um, to be given to different people, and also kind of a haunting message to me that said, "Keep the lines open. We're going to write some books, um, so keep the lines open." And I. I remember I was grieving so much that I didn't even, I had no idea what that even, that didn't mean anything to me at all then. And I was into this field already, an awareness of the afterlife and that you can communicate with those who have died, that kind of thing. But I hadn't been in it but a couple of months, and I was in the seminary studying for the ministry, uh, for your ministry, and when this happened. And uh, here were these amazing notes, this whole b- a notebook full of uh, of notes and his, things like, I will use my spirit's will to help others uh, through troubles, and he has certainly done that. So um, when we discovered that he had died, I mean, a parent goes into such an incredible state of grieving, and I think 
uh, as I've worked with parents whose children have died in various ways, accidents, illness, and all, all of us go through this, what if, what could I have done? But when your child commits suicide, you really do this incredibly painful soul-searching. What did I do to, to cause that? What could have been done differently? And um, my friends, I had several friends who started picking up messages from Stephen, but I actually was grieving so much that I, he couldn't have gotten through if he tried. But they would bring me these different messages, and I went to a couple of psychics, and it wasn't all that evidential. Um, and a couple of things that he said to my friends, you know, really made sense, but I couldn't hear him. And so I would go in his room and meditate every night and cry. And uh, little by little, over a period of a few months, and this is what I write about in his book, um, I would begin to be able to hear things. And then he would say, I know what a skeptic you are, Mom. I'll prove it to you. And he would move something or do something. And I, I wasn't even sure that I wasn't imagining that. Uh, or if any of the information coming through was was valid. I mean, I w- was so new into this field that I questioned everything, and I felt like you know the world's greatest failure. Your child takes their life, but he left he left an interesting message. He said, "I was not going to be able to stay long, and I could have gone by suicide, illness, or uh, an accident." And he said, "You mm-hmm. and I met, and in our dreams." Um, and I, I discover now that that was before he ever entered even life. And we mm-hmm. talked about how, what kind of death that I would have that would do the most help for other people. And you would speak about suicide when no one else would and write about it. And so you and I decided, like a soul contract, that we, mm-hmm. would, um, we would fulfill this soul contract. And I didn't wow. believe that for a minute. And... Um, I mean, I just didn't know. So anyway, over the over the time, I began to be able to hear him. He would do so many evidential things, like we, I was riding in a car down Scottsdale Road here in Phoenix, and um, he was telling me some things about work I was going to do in the future. And I said, can that possibly be true? I could hear him as I was driving along. It was hard to drive and listen. And he said, look up. And I looked up, and the truck in front of me had uh, slanted across the back of it Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, which is not the usual spelling of Stephen. And he said, how about that? I mean, things like that. Or he would say, look at the clock, and it would be 3.33, or uh, that was the main number, or 11.11. Not that he made that happen, but he would draw my attention to it at particular times like that. I mean, those were little things. Um, one of the things he did was the um, we had a ceramic music uh, box Christmas tree, a, a large one. It was like an actual tree, and it played Silent Night, and it had been broken for ages. And one night I was sitting there after a particularly busy medical program I'd been in, and it began to play and play over and over again. And my young daughter, Debbie, his sister, uh, looked up and she said, Mom, Stephen's here. Listen to him, just like that. And I listened, and he said, I want to prove to you it's me someone is going to give you a piano tomorrow. And I went, what? And the next day in the medical program that I had just been, you know, finishing up with that I had, uh, I did all kinds of teaching classes, therapy, and a couple came up and said, you know what, we want to give your family a piano. (laughs) So that's the kind of thing he did to prove it was him because I was so skeptical. So then I went to a psychic in Santa Barbara, California, named George Daisley. A couple of books have been written about him. And he didn't know me. I had not written a book at that time. It would have been hard to to find out who I was. There was no social media, you know, then. And um, I went to him, and he immediately brought Stephen through. He said, who is Steve? And that's what Stephen called himself. And he started telling me things Stephen said that no one could have known but me. Like on the right hand side by, the, by your bed, you, there you've kept all my things. He said, "Give those away. They're no good to, to anyone anymore. Give them away and let someone enjoy them." You know things like that. So my book is filled with these stories of evidential things. And you could say, well, one or two things. It could be your imagination. But I mean, I have had hundreds of things of of signs from him and continue to this day to do that. So I'm writing a sequel to Stephen Lives uh, called Always in My Heart. And I'm going to really address 
soul contracts and the courage it has it takes for a lot of souls to fulfill soul contracts with disease and accidents and illness and um and that's why Rob Schwartz's book he was your first guest on right yes he was yes. on your very first program yes he was yes he his books your soul's gift your soul's plan I recommend to everyone um, the healing power of the life you planned before you were born. I mean, listen to that, the life you planned before you were born, which yes. all of these psychics he's gone to and mediums have confirmed that before we come in, we do a great deal of soul planning of what we're going to try to accomplish. We always have free will, but we do soul planning. And then I read a book by Joel Whitten, um, W-H-I-T-T-O-N, a um psychiatrist in Toronto called Life Between Life, and he talked about the bardo uh, stage, the Tibetan word, the state in between lives where we plan our next incarnation. So his book, Rob's books, other things that I've read, really made me understand that this was more than just what I wrote about in my first book, that there, and he had, and I put a few things in my first book that allude to that, but I just had had learned so much since then about these soul contracts that we have. And, and I'm speaking this Sunday at our, our uh, service, our next Sunday at our service, um, on soul contracts, because that's I believe that if we look at the death of our children, either they've telegraphed to us that they're going to be leaving or we have some time. To, you know, like with your son, you had three extra years with him yeah. after yeah. he was supposed to die. Yeah. I yes. think that mm -hmm. there's a kind of plan in effect, and you know it. You know when to pull the plug. You know when not to. You know, you had mm -hmm. that feeling with him that yes, you I definitely couldn't do did. that. that that's, yeah. um, the, this past year when he went in the hospital, uh, April of 2014, I, 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 you know, I thank God for the three extra years. And I didn't know at that time what was going to happen. Um, I prayed that I was going to bring him home again. But I did believe, I believe, especially since I was going through this for the third time, I mean, second time in three years, um, I said this, this, was a con this was something he and I planned. I believed that. And that's what made me search on Google Soul's Plan, and that's how I found Robert <laughs> and his books, <laughs> which were wonderful. And I, I yeah. got his books, and I read both books while I was in the hospital with my son on life support. So, and I believed it. You know, I I knew already. Kyle and I, we we planned this, and maybe three years ago, I wasn't quite ready. So we said, okay, let's delay the plan a little bit. <laughs> three years, let's let her get ready <laughs> for this. You know, and so I the I thank God for those three years. You know, because I definitely wasn't ready three years ago. But um, knowing that it was a a soul contract, a soul plan. I still don't know why. I love the fact that you um, have had time and, and have communicated with Stephen and kind of know the plan and why. Um, I still don't really know the why, but I do know. I definitely oh, believe I didn't in my heart. either, uh, Caroline. I didn't know the why for a long time. And I think really Rob's books and um, Joel Witten's books and a few other things, Neil Walsh, actually when he wrote Conversations for God, um, I love the fact that he, he admitted openly he talked to God and God talked back to him because I had been doing that since I was a kid and I'd, I thought everybody talked to God and God answered back. Well, oh, he gave wow. me the courage awesome. after I met him and we talked. He's just He wrote just such a wonderful bunch of books, especially book one was just my all-time favorite, over, underlined over and over, that I realized that I had to come out of the closet and tell people I was talking to God, too. So I wrote a book called Messages from God about my conversations yes. with God since I was a kid and uh, awesome. how first time I told an adult friend that, God and I talk, she goes, oh, you can't talk to God. You can talk to him, but he doesn't answer you back. Oh, you can't do that. That's not right. And I, it was just hilarious because I had all my life. I knew it was okay. And um, and I think that it's a similar parallel with our children and our loved ones who died. Yes, you can talk to them. No, it is not something of the devil or some bad thing to do, and it is not not truly against the teachings of Jesus. And for people that are Christian, I use this uh, scripture. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration talked to Moses and Elijah, and three of his friends saw them also, and they were dead. 
And he mm-hmm. said, whatever I do, you can do in greater things than these. So if yeah. Jesus, if, if you're a believer in Jesus, who has left this beautiful scripture, um, it does that and says you can do this in greater, then I think that we have a great uh, example there. And in a lot of other religions, even Jewish mysticism and, oh, just about every religion, not every, but almost everyone, there right. is thing in there about communing with the world of spirit if you know if we want to listen to that and affirm that this is a god-given gift to us that um we can use and we don't have it's not that we don't grieve but once you understand that death isn't the end the soul is eternal and that you can communicate and have like i have uh, Stephen died in 1974 and that seems like a long time ago and oh you know that's so far back I have had an ongoing uh, relationship with him since he died, and so have some of my friends. Wow, that's so wonderful. Now, Kyle, my son, has only been gone, um, I guess, eight, nine months now. I'm, I'm losing track of the months. It's, it hasn't yeah, been a year. I know. But I, I have, he has communicated with me, most definitely. Oh, wonderful. Um, I, um, I have his phone. It's a pretty. It was a pretty new, new smartphone. I don't use smartphones myself, but he has a smartphone. So I have his phone, and I was going through um, his um, his texts, and he um, texted a friend. He sent a text while he was in the hospital that he was afraid, and he didn't know what decision to make about. Um, the surgery that the doctors and the surgeons were recommending. Um, this is. Um, prior to him getting a transplant, I mean, before he got a transplant, they were talking about doing a, a, sur- a major surgery on him. And he was nervous and afraid, and he didn't talk to me about it. And he communicated with some of his friends, but didn't talk to me. So when I read that text, I was just in tears. I'm like, Kyle, why didn't you talk to me? Well, you know, I'm completely holistic. And um, I I got to the point said, okay, Kyle, you're grown, you're 29 years old. I'll let you make your medical decisions, but okay, as far as me, we don't want to try to do anything invasive. You know, at least you know, try not to do much as you can with surgery. You know, um, so he didn't talk to me, and when I read that. It just broke my heart, and I was I was in tears, and I'm like, Kyle, why didn't you talk to me? So I was in my bedroom crying. Then I came out to my office, with, and my computer was on, and it was on Facebook, and I didn't I wanted to go to Google, and my computer screen froze, it would not move. It made me look at what was on Facebook, and what you know how people upload um, posters on Facebook. With, all the time, there was this huge poster that was frozen on my computer screen, and I have I wrote it down. It said, "Sometimes I wish I could go back and tell myself what I know now." That's what was frozen on my computer screen. So that's what he. I was say, screaming. I was saying, "Kyle, why didn't you talk to me?" So now he's he's saying to me, "I wish I could go back and tell talk to you now." You know. So I'm like, "Oh, so I know, I know." A hundred percent, a thousand percent, nobody can tell me that was not Kyle communicating with me. No, (laughs) those are the kind of, they're called synchronistic experiences that um, that you just can't deny, and Stephen has done that. And f- I'll tell you what he did for about six weeks that was absolutely phenomenal. I, my office, uh, my husband and I have offices also in our home, and um, mm-hmm. our bedroom is close by, and we were in bed, and I heard this music coming out of my uh, computer, and it was musical notes. You know the, the, the movie about... Uh, so what is it, uh, the spaceship's landing, and they had these musical notes that played all the time, kind of like that. Mm-hmm. I've forgotten the name of the, the movie. Well, it, it wasn't those notes, but there were a series of notes. They didn't have any particular uh, pattern, and they would come on at different times during the night and day. And mm-hmm. we finally hooked up a thing to record them, and we recorded dozens upon dozens of them. And when we would say, Stephen, is that you? Then they would stop. And then we would oh. talk to him. And then when he wanted to talk with us, he would do that. So he was able to do that for about six weeks. We had computer techies, you know, looking at what is right. could this possibly be. And every one of them said, we have never seen anything like this. So I played it publicly at a 
a workshop that a big uh, conference that I did, and you know people there that really were technically savvy said they had mm-hmm. they had never heard anything like that. It's not like musical notes. It was like mm-hmm. otherworldly. It was I can't even explain, it, but I do have it, and um, and that was just one of the the kinds of things that he did. And you know I belong to two organizations that really work with uh, children who've died and. Sherry Pearl has, I told you, the organization, I told you about both these, um, the prayer registry where on the date of the death of the child, no matter what age, they, some are 50 years and some are just the other day, they are prayed for every year on the anniversary of their date, and the parent can leave a message there, and you can add your prayers, and you can listen to a meditation or you know, and meditate and pray for the children. And so what, sometimes there may be one or two children on, sometimes eight or nine. And uh, it's a wonderful thing because so many of these parents are having experiences with their children who died. And they, there's an openness there with Sherry Pearl, who uh, founded this, an openness with her to listen to their stories because she wrote a wonderful book called Lost and Found, the story of her son's death and her communicating with him afterwards. It's one of the... One of the, right along with Rob Schwartz, one of the best books that I have read uh, in how to learn to listen to our children. It is just such a credible, really, really good book. And then the wow. other organization that, that my heart's in is Helping Parents Heal, founded mm-hmm. by Elizabeth Basson. And that's the, the one that you know you just joined that we talked about. Um, right. And mm-hmm. she um, has now, let's see, 6,000 members. I was one of the, uh, on the original board and original founding members of it. And uh, she has now 6,000 children that um, she memorializes on the date of their birth and the date of their death with a photo and a blurb from the parent about them, and then people can leave messages just like in Sherry Pearl's web, uh, Facebook site. So these are two organizations where there's an openness to having parents communicate um, what they've experienced in a parano- of a paranormal nature, and nobody makes fun of that, but everybody understands because we've all had these experiences. And over right. the years, as I have worked with literally hundreds of children who – um, have talked to me about wanting to take their lives or that have almost died or whatever, and of parents whose children have died, almost every time that child telegraphs to the parent in some way that they're not going to be around long. One woman mm-hmm. whose child was killed, um, and, uh, he was in his 30s, was killed in a motorcycle accident, said to her the week before, if I should die tomorrow, Mom, I've had a wonderful life. I've done everything I came to do, and I've loved you, and I've felt loved. And a, just a beautiful ending that turned out to be an ending, of course, that she didn't realize at the time. My husband's um, brother's six-year-old daughter was killed in a car wreck. And um, months before she died, she said, I'm not going to be with you and Mom very long. I've been meeting with Jesus, and I'm soon going to be with Jesus. I was sitting on his lap, and I can't stay with you long. And they would go, oh, stop that, that stop that, you know, saying that kind of thing. And right. after she died, of course, they remembered all this. Oh, my so goodness. So Stephen had a yeah. similar thing, and it's in my book. He had dream after dream after dream of Jesus when he was maybe, he died at 15, so he was about, 10 to 12 in that range, we never wrote them down. We just went, we listened, we said, that is beautiful, that's wonderful, and about his friendship and love of Jesus and their meeting Mm -hmm. on the other side and his dreams. Right. Oh, my goodness. Well, I honestly, um, I've all, uh, I think Kyle, I I know Kyle communicated with me before he was born. Um, I didn't know what to name Kyle. And I almost almost left the hospital with him unnamed. And the name Kyle came to me in a dream. And I, I, I honestly believe I remember him whispering it in my ear in a dream before he was born that told me to name him Kyle. And now I'm using his name, Kyle, for the foundation that I'm, I'm, um, I'm founding, a nonprofit foundation in his honor, and Kyle stands for Keep Your Light Expanding. And I, I, I know believe. I just logged on to it, and I saw the yes. uh, 
pictures that you put, what are they called, uh, all the pictures you put together in the show? They oh, yeah. beautiful. The done. montage. The memorial montage. montage. Beautifully yes. done yes. montage. And um, what a what a adorable baby and what a good-looking young man. <laughs> I mean, it just, I know yes. that you are really so new to this grieving process that you will discover that in the coming years it will be like a grand awakening to all the things where he communicates and all the things you experience. You can end up writing a book because our kids want to talk to us. They want to let us know we're okay. And, you know, when you said he was, you think he whispered the name, my daughter, um, my granddaughter, Crystalline, um, my daughter was pregnant. She had a dream. A little girl, dark-haired girl, held her hands up and said, Poi, and told her to name her Crystalline. And... Mm. When my daughter Debbie woke up, she said, um, I've known her before in Hawaii, and I'm to name her Crystalline. The next night, she had a dream of how to spell it. So instead of C-R-Y, it was, they said, spell it K-R-Y, name her Crystalline, K-R-Y-S-T-A-L-Y-N, spelled it out for her. Oh, my goodness, wow. Yes. And I don't know how That's familiar amazing. you are with the Edgar Casey readings, but oh, let me say this first, because there's so much you and I can't cover in this short period of time, but... If people want more information about this, we have a website called Logos, L-O-G-O-S, Center, C-E-N-T-E-R, dot org, O-R-G. There are free downloads on it. There's all this information about Edgar Cayce. There's who was one of the, is probably the best research psychic in history. He did 14,000 life readings in a trance or altered state and got cures for diseases and all kinds of things, which are still being used today. And mm-hmm. He said, children choose their parents and the time and place of their birth before they're born. And Mm -hmm. he said, the other thing he said, and when I'm speaking uh, the first Sunday of uh, April, it's going to be, they are being part of a soul contract coming in, and we have the free will to complete that contract or not. And um, we we have to look at things a little differently, that there are hardly ever Ever any accidents? That there's no hardly such thing as an accident. Right. Well, I actually, I honestly believe there are no such thing as an accident or coincidence. I think it's all a, a great mosaic, uh, like a snowflake. I like to think of life as a snowflake, and everything is connected. And truly, I don't believe there are any accidents or, or uh, coincidences. It's I don't all... think there are very many. I'm going to say that there could possibly sometime be something unplanned, but mostly I agree 100% with you, and I call it like a tapestry. Every okay. thread is woven with the other, so when I do something loving with you, it's mm-hmm. going to reach out not only to you but back to me. Um, right. When something happens, it's like the butterfly effect, if you've read about it. If a butterfly waves its wings in um, a foreign country, it can create a hurricane and another thing because of just this... The energies right. of everything affect everything else, and you can tell I'm passionate connected. about. It. I have <laughs> I have spent my entire adult life researching the afterlife. I've um, spoken about it a lot, and not just because of Stephen, but you know other things that have happened. Like my mother died, and I was there when she died in Chattanooga, and. Um, before she had died, I had talked to her on the phone, and I said, Mother, you, she said, I know, it's just a matter of days now, hurry down. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have a grand celebration on the other side, meet Daddy and Stephen, and it's my son Stephen, and all the mm-hmm. people you love. And she said, I hope you're right, I hope you're right. Well, I got mm-hmm. down there, and she was already starting to um, go into a, a kind of a coma, and she died, and the next day, I was standing by uh, the bed where they had taken her to the morgue from, and I heard her out loud say, you were right, you were right. Mm -hmm. And my sister, who is a very fundamentalist Christian, uh, lived with my mother, and I knew if I told her that, she would probably, you know, hold a cross up in front of me to ask me to leave. So I very (laughs) gently said, I just had a dream. Mother said, you were right. I did see Daddy and Stephen and everybody because okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't tell her. You, you cannot tell somebody yes. that's frightened of it that. Yes, exactly. I understand what you're saying. You have to, yes, when when you're talking to people, you have to hear how open they are before you can kind of just say certain things. But 
I I experienced actually my mom passed in 2011 and she passed March 2011 the month after Kyle was diagnosed with congestive heart failure and I never did tell her about his um condition because she was already in the hospital and we knew she didn't have long so it, um but the last thing I said to her and I called her back I I wasn't at she was at in in hospice at a nursing home and I called her back just to say, Mom, I love you. And she started to cry. Um, my my daughter was with her, and my daughter said, Why did, what did you say to Grandma? I said, I, I said, Ma, I love you. And I called her back to say that because I kind of felt that might be the last words I said to her. And then she Aww. did go the next day, and those were the last words I said to her. So, yeah. um, you just do that intuitively. Well, yes. you know, when we were talking earlier, I wanted to share with you one of the most evidential things that Stephen ever did, um, because I I hope that anyone listening to this has the hope that not only is it possible to communicate with our loved ones who've died, but that they can give us really evidential information. And we work with a really fine psychic, one of the best I've ever worked with, not that there aren't many good psychics. Uh, she's a psychic medium called the Carefree Medium, her name is Suzanne Wilson, and she's here in mm-hmm. Carefree, Arizona, you know, where we are. But she's called the Carefree Medium, and I've had a reading from her, as have most everybody I know, and she's brought through their loved ones from spirit and animals that have died the whole bit. So in Rob Schwartz's books, he, he interviews a lot of these psychics and psychic mediums and uses that in his material, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Well, she she brought through Stephen and, a, and our dog that had died, but... Steve, here's what Stephen told me that was just the most evidential thing he's ever done. We had He had told me to write this book, and so he would dictate it, and I would write from memory, and he would change things that I was wrong about. And We, did, we wrote the whole book. He'd, I did not write that book. Uh, Stephen lives my son. Stephen is life, suicide, naturally. I didn't write that book. That is not my book. Um, and as we were writing it, we decided to self-publish it and give it to some of our friends in you know, a limited printing. And he said, came to me and he said, Mom, um, you're going to get four bids on your book. It's going to be published by a major publisher in New York City and um, and some other things. And he said, now I want you to start telling your friends, telling your friends that. Tell Herb and then tell your friends. And I said, but I can't. That's not true. I don't have any bids on it. We've self-published it and it was out and it was selling well. I mean, you know, and the people that read it loved it. I said, I can't do that. He said, start saying it because the Casey readings say the mind is right. the builder and the physical is the result. So I very tentatively said to my husband, Stephen said we're going to have four bids and it's going to be bought by a major publisher in New York. He said, oh great. I mean, he didn't even have any doubt. Well, I did. Right. I told a couple of our really close friends, and they went, oh, that's wonderful. And within a month, me doing absolutely nothing, I had four bids by major publishers in New York, and Simon & Schuster outbid them and bought the book and published it in hardcover first, then paperback, then mass paperback, and on audio. And, wow. he, you know, he said, see, Mom, I told you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if that is evidential, you can't that, get much more evidential than that. No, yes, you're you're very open. You you can you actually can hear him, and that is wonderful. I I try every night to before I go to bed. I said I want to be able. I know Kyle and I communicate in my dreams, and but I don't remember them. So I want to be able to remember them. So I I'll say that before I go to bed, let me remember the conversations I have with Kyle, because I know we communicate. I just, um, I have to work on building up that psychic muscle, because we, we all, we all psychic. It. Yes, to a degree, yeah. but we just have to build that muscle. To yeah, really just like we exercise to build up the strength in our calves and thighs. We have to do that. Exactly. Exactly. Opening that third eye. You know, meditating. But um, one of the things I know um, when I know, and I see him, see it all the time that I am in communication with Kyle is when I see his, his car. He purchased the car um, a few months, actually a few weeks, six weeks before he went into the hospital. He bought a, a newer car. It wasn't a new car, but a, 
It was a car, and he loved that car. And when I see that car, it's a GMC truck, I know, I say, every time I see it, I was like, okay, I know you're there, Kyle. And that's, and I see it all the time. It's like more and more. And today I, I saw it a lot. I just, that I knew he was with me today a lot. It's like, okay. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, let me just say again that uh, Sherry Pearl's book, Lost and Found, about the death of her son who died from an overdose. Um, mm-hmm. There are a group of us, and our children have died in every possible way, murder, suicide, uh, DUIs, all kinds of things. Um, mm-hmm. This Lost and Found is one of the, the most helpful about especially when you're starting, when you're doubting and you're early into this, and, and not that, you know, her son's been dead for several years, but mm-hmm. when you doubt this and you're not sure if you're hearing, really specific ways to listen, and I do that also in my book. I write down steps that I take to prepare myself, and so I I very often get into a meditative state and then keep a journal with me and ask Stephen questions and have learned how to hear him either telepathically, sometimes he speaks out loud, sometimes mm-hmm. he's voice that I can hear in my head from out in front of me or out to the side of me, and sometimes I hear him in my head. So I have like a half a dozen different ways that, that I can mm-hmm. hear him, and he appeared to my um, his sister, Debbie, my daughter, mm-hmm. when she was nine years old, right after his death. She called me at work and she said, Mom, Stephen was just here. He had on his karate gi and he was fixing breakfast. And she said, Mom, I'm not making this up. He appeared. Come home, come home. And I rushed home. And year after year, her story never changed. Uh Um, And I know that he did appear to her. And the only thing that I did that was really not so good, I thought, Stephen, why didn't you appear to me? Why didn't you appear to your (laughs) mama? (laughs) And so in my book, Uh there's a story from his, uh, there's a letter um, mm-hmm. to Stephen from his sisters and also his brother, which are just, every time I read them, they make me cry because they wrote about how they felt about his death and his life. And they're just absolutely treasures that, you know, always will mean something in my life to me. I had almost identical experience. Um, on the day my son passed, my daughter, uh, is his oldest older sibling, she's four years older than Kyle, um, she saw Kyle um, that afternoon. She was at a doctor's appointment, and in the waiting room, she said Kyle was in the waiting room, and he kept laughing at her. And um, I said, what did he say? And then she started talking to him. And she's in a, a, a doctor's office waiting room and talking with nobody else can see. And then he said to her, you're talking to me, but nobody else can see me but you. And so oh, then he wow. started laughing at her. And I and I was like, why did he go to her and not me? You know. <laughs> so I experienced the exact same thing. He went to his sister on the day that he passed, and not to me. So I know he saw him. Oh, exactly the feeling. I know exactly the feeling. <laughs> and. Uh, We've had we've had other appearances and where they've heard him and, and things of that kind, but that was the most uh, in that she said she could actually see him as if he were fully alive and moving. That it wasn't like you know misty kind of thing, and right. she said it scared her um, because she was nine years old. And here was her mm-hmm. brother she knew was dead, but uh, he has kept in you know he watches over them and occasionally he'll say, "Mom, you need to call." Who, whichever child it is, and talk to them. They're mm-hmm. going through a rough time. I said, well, what, what's happening? He said, I'm not allowed to tell you that, but just call them up oh. and cheer them mm-hmm. up. And, you know, because they don't intrude on people's free will. And, right. you know, there's a, you may be familiar with Khalil Gibran and his poetry. Um, he was a Lebanese uh, poet and just wrote some beautiful things, The Prophet and other things. And he has this great quote from his book, um, chapter, I think, on spirits. It says, between the people of eternity and the people of earth, there is constant communication, and oftentimes a person will perform an act believing that it's his own free will, and in fact he's being guided and impelled with precision to do it by the other mm. side. Okay. So mm. I, that's how I feel about Herb's life and my life, um, that we really are constantly being communicated with from the spirit plane. We've 
we've had conversations with most of our friends that have died, not not everyone, and some of them tell us that their their mission is to just go on and to learn and that some souls who die have a mission to continue to work with those on the earth plane to raise consciousness, mm-hmm. to teach oneness, to uh, to do all those kind of things. So Stephen is is one of those, as are many, many, many uh, children who die. Right. It, 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 I it, believe it, that. Because you know that the soul is eternal, there is really no death, and that yes. it's just a change of form. You drop off your earth suit. I call it the pod. You have a pod mm-hmm. around you. You take off your pod, and your soul's free, and it continues mm-hmm. forever. It can hear, see, know what we're doing. It can um, communicate with us. That's what we all are souls, and that will never die, and love never dies. So the soul's yes. eternal, love is eternal. They don't, they're they not away from us. We're just uh, mostly unaware. Right, correct. Um, I And I did express that to both my mom and Kyle before they pass, um, that I don't believe in death. I said, there's, there's only eternal life. And when I was in the hospital room with Kyle, I, I said to Kyle, it's your decision, you know, to stay or to go, you know. But I know that, um, that there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to fear. Um, and whatever your decision is, I'm, I will have to make peace with it this, this time. Not three years ago, but this time. Um, I, but I said, it's, all, it's up to you. It's up to you, and I know that um, that you're not gone. You're with me every moment of the day. So um, everyone like, I just... should have a mother like you. <laughs> so <laughs> and my mother grieved so much for Stephen. I mean, it was, and she be- she actually believed in reincarnation. It was strange. She was Church mm-hmm. of Christ. She believed in mm-hmm. reincarnation, but she wasn't sure about some of the other stuff. And she just grieved terribly for him. And I said, Mother, he is not gone. He is His soul is eternal. And um, my family, I have, I have a family in the South, and, of course, that's not their particular belief, but um, mm-hmm. they tolerate me, and most of them speak to me. <laughs> but even if you don't agree with that, <laughs> I just find it, it, it exciting that, so many people now are getting messages from their loved ones, and there's so much evidential um, mediumship. It used to be yes. everything was in the dark. Everything was kind of like, you know, I don't right. even know the words to use, a woo-woo, I guess. And yes. now, yes. you know, national people are talking about it. Evan Alexander, who spoke at our conference, who's an MD. Yes, who wrote I met book. him, and that, oh, that's you did. another book. Proof? Yes, I met him. I met him Good at heaven, the yeah. New Jersey. Yes, I met Eben Alexander. Wasn't he nice? At the Expo. Yes, I met him, at, and he signed my book, Proof of Heaven. That's the first book I read. Actually, I read Proof of Heaven. Oh, proof of Heaven, of course. I read, right. Yes, I read that. The first book I read while I was in the hospital with Kyle was Proof of Heaven. And then I met him uh, last May the first week of May at the Expo in New Jersey, Spirit Mind, Body, Spirit Expo uh-huh. in New Jersey, and he signed he, my book. <laughs> he has a wonderful story. It's just it's yeah. amazing. And Bill Guggenheim is the one who introduced us to Eben, uh, and he spoke for us, and we got to be friends. He's just a delightful person. Bill Guggenheim wrote the absolute most wonderfully researched book. It's called Hello from Heaven, Bestseller is just an amazing book. Uh, he and his ex-wife um, researched, I think it was several, three or 4,000 people and interviewed them and uh, talked to them, whether they were believers or non-believers, about experiences mm-hmm. they felt they had had with a loved one who died. And he put them right. in there according to categories. And um, it's just helped so many people to be aware of their loved ones communicating by the dozens of different ways that they try to let us know that they've continued. Um, right. Stephen had a funny thing he did. He um, sometimes, that, because we run the Logo Center and we've had a center for 30-some years, and um, so we have a really busy life, and sometimes mm-hmm. I would have two weeks when I hadn't talked to him, and he would contact our Allstate agent, who was a very intuitive woman, and he would say, mm-hmm. 
my mother has not listened to me in 11 days. Would you call her and tell her I need to talk to her? (laughs) She would call me up and tell me, and sure enough, it was 11 days. Or she would call Uh up and say, Anne, it's been two weeks, and Stephen hasn't been able to get through to you. You've been too busy. And sure enough, every time. And so when she wow. passed away, I missed that little link where he could get to her through to her. But right. now I try to get better touch with him. But he yeah. um, he has he has a lot to share. And in the second book, uh, always in my heart, um, I, I had a funny t- how the title was given to me. I was out using the copier in our library here at home, and um, I heard a voice say, "Would you like to know the title of uh, the sequel to Stephen Lives?" And I said, "Yes." Mm. And one of my guides said, always in my heart. And I said, oh, what a nice title. And mm-hmm. so I was finished my copying, went back to my office, and I forgot what they said. I could not remember <laughs> what they said. I tried to tune in. I couldn't get hold of anybody on the other side. I could not make uh, a tune with anyone. Connection. So mm. a few hours later, I hear my guide again. He said, are you ready to hear what the title is again? I said, yes. He said, get a pen and paper and write it down. <laughs> write it down. <laughs> Make a folder and write it down, always in my heart. So oh, that I love that. I love that, always in my heart. Because I, oh, I say to people all the time, you know, when, I, when people first find out that I lost my son a few months ago, I say, he's always with me. He's always in my heart. So that title is so, so wonderful. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just you'll yeah. find that there are a lot of groups that um, work with, people whose children have died and do a really wonderful job. Compassionate Friends have some groups that are helpful and Family Foundation and just a lot of places. But I really think that Sherry Pearl's group, the Prayer Registry, and Elizabeth Bassan's group, Helping Parents Heal, are have mm-hmm. been two of the most helpful for me personally. I know that when I joined Helping Parents Heal, the first time, it, I think it was Stephen's birthday, December the 3rd, And they put his picture up and whatever I had written about him, several paragraphs. And I I cried because here was my child being remembered by these hundreds of people. They all sent me little messages, what a handsome boy, I'm sorry for your loss. And that is very consoling to a parent no matter how many years ago their children died. So, you know, part of what I know we were going to talk about is suicide. And I, I will say this, not only Stephen, but... The guides I've worked with, the mediums I've gone to, and the psychics I've worked with say to a one that the the afterlife of a suicide is no different from someone who was in a car accident or Mm -hmm. someone who was killed or someone who was ill. And I think it's hard for people whose children have committed suicide to really believe that because there's still a stigma about suicide. Um, oh, they must have had a mental problem, or they must have had a chemical imbalance. Well, you know, certainly some do, and certainly there are people who kill other people and commit suicide, and that's a whole different ball game. But when you have a young child take their lives, and this child then communicates from the other side, or even if they don't, you've got to mm-hmm. look at that and say, is there something, is there a gift in this death that I can learn from, and is there something I can do to try to raise consciousness through this death. And yeah. um, just recently um, we had um, a woman contact us and uh, her uh, young child under 15 had committed suicide and had come from the other side and said, I started to do it earlier to stop the bickering in the family and I thought maybe if I was gone you would stop fighting with each other. Mm. Now, those parents take that message right. seriously and say, look, what can we do to try to be one and raise consciousness instead of this divisiveness, then that right. child will have completed a soul contract, and they will have too. But if they don't learn right. from it, then right. that that death was in vain in a way because mm-hmm. that courageous little soul gave up their life to try to bring harmony to a family. So, you know... Mm-hmm. There, there's, yeah. there's so many hundreds of stories you know, I could tell you. It's, it's yeah. the field I love. It's the work that I really love doing. I feel like these kids are over there by the thousands wanting to make contact. And Stephen once said to me, Mom, if you knew how many thousands of kids were here and how few parents listen or believe or trust that they can talk with us. 
she he said mm-hmm. it's heartbreaking for them, and those of us that have made a contact are just so very thankful that you listen. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. So well, one doing... of the things that well, one of the things that Robert um, mentioned and brought up um, on the first show was about you know suicide um, not being a, um, a stigma. Matter of fact, Robert said every death is a suicide from a soul level. I, I agree with him one hundred percent. Every yeah, death, if you look at stop. it, is as much a suicide as someone who shoots himself in the head. Mm-hmm. Exactly, because the soul decides when to come into this life and when to leave. It's always the soul's choice. So on right. a soul level, every death is a suicide. Well, exactly, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. the person knows they've come in for a period of time. They know they're going to mm-hmm. have this accident. They, it, if people understood this tapestry that... Mm-hmm. It would be so healing for some of their grief. Not that they wouldn't grieve, because you miss. You know how you miss right. Kyle's you miss body that. and his presence. Yes. Oh yes, I miss Stevens. Yes. But if yes. they would understand that there is communication, that you have to learn to listen in a different way. You have to take time to get quiet, prepare yourself, so that they can come in on the waves of your own thought, or allow you to see or hear them, because you've you've raised your energies and they have lowered theirs to communicate with you, there would be so much less grieving and it it wouldn't be such a tragedy every time or thought to be such a tragedy. So when we right. hear of when we hear of a of a train wreck or whatever, we go, Wow, a bunch of people are fulfilling a soul contract. Mhm. And yes, even there was is, there was some kind of plane crash. Now, I, I say some kind of plane crash recently because I, I haven't listened to news since 9-11. I stopped and, watching news. I haven't listened, <laughs> and, but my husband and a few friends are over and were telling me about this um, airline crash that the they think the um, the uh, co-pilot uh, committed suicide and did that. Mm-hmm. Well, but think about it. If he did, mm-hmm. and who, mm-hmm. who knows, but if he did... Then 151 people on board that flight were part they of this that. contract, and they are not yes. victims. They are right. willing participants. Why? We can't guess why. It could be to raise consciousness about air safety. It could be, who knows? I mean, that's why it says judge not, because you, you have no yes. idea what it could be. But it's something. Exactly. It's not a God that just arbitrarily takes some lives and, and has this revenge. It's a just loving universe that makes sense and it all functions as one together if we will look at it Mm -hmm. that's why i love i know i sound like (laughs) conversations with god there are no villains and there's no victims that's exactly right it's, it's all everything is done on the soul level and we may not understand in our human consciousness and our limited human consciousness, we don't understand it. We don't see the big picture. But no, we, um, on the big, you know, on, on the soul level, there it was all pre predestined or prearranged. But predestined and also free well, will go hand in hand. But with free will, it's like they came in with a contract, but they had the right. free will to do or not do that contract and the choices that they made. And exactly. Um, one of my teachers, one of my mentors is Master Stephen Coe, who wrote Your Hands Can Heal You, who's the head of pranic healing here in uh, the United States. And he mm-hmm. said, we must forgive everybody. We must forgive each other. But sometimes when you're forgiving, you have to be taking out a restraining order. So mm-hmm. there is wisdom in forgiving everybody, mm-hmm. being one, but not being a doormat to be walked over. Stand up to exactly. your right. And take out a restraining order if that's needed. That doesn't mean you're not forgiving. It means you're wise. Right. So right. Yes. Yes. I mean, if we are kind of separate, middle road. Yes. If you need to separate from a person because that person is being violent and abusive, no, definitely you do not take the abuse. You do not take the violence. You separate. You love them. Like I wish you well, but I gotta go. You know. <laughs> and that kind of agree a hundred percent. You know, we sign contracts with a, a contractor to remodel our house, and when the job's mm-hmm. over, the contract is finished. But we forget that people, individuals, have contracts, that we have maybe a contract for marriage, and that marriage does not work out, but we have finished that contract with that person. And what maybe a friendship, 
goes awry. Maybe it could be that contract is finished, or it could be maybe mm-hmm. there are things that can be done to heal that relationship. And it's right. up to the individuals what they do, but we always have free will. So Stephen yes. could have said, no, I'm not going to kill myself. So right. I, when you think about Jesus and these avatars of light, like Yogananda, didn't he, he just said to his, his, uh, his group one time, I am leaving, this is the night I'm going. He laid down and his soul left his body, and he did not even decay 30 days later when he was shown he had not done any decay. So that was a very conscious wow. death. There's a term for yes, that I, in um, Sanskrit. I just saw uh, the movie God. Awaken. Awaken? Yeah. And, and I so, just saw that. I just saw that. Yeah, it's awesome. just amazing if we start looking at things differently that most of these avatars have have uh, made choices to come, to go, to leave us with knowledge and Maybe everybody's sole purpose is to help make this a better world and to serve, and maybe mm-hmm. within that sole purpose are these sole contracts with individuals. You know, I don't know yes. all the answers. I'm just still searching okay. myself. Yes, but um, I, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head. It's not even like knowing all the answers, but kind of understanding the reason why, like understanding that we did make a sole plan with, different individuals before we came here. And that it gives me peace. You know, I it know that, you know, that I can go on in, a, in peace and know that Kyle is always with me and that, you know, I don't have to... I mean, I cry, I, mean, I, I cried a little about an hour ago when I thought of him. You know, so I still cry, but I know that he's with me and, and I can go on in peace and, and then do something positive with the experience. And that's how I feel. I still cry when I think of Stephen. He just had an anniversary of the day he took his life, uh, uh, March the 18th. And that was a rough couple of days for me, the day he died and the day that they found his body. Two days Mm -hmm. that are really, really emotionally still, after all these years, painful. And yet he's there talking to me. And I'm still hurting because I miss his sweet little face and his little pod and his, you know, it's just his personality which his personality yeah. has stayed pretty much the same. Um, and so he's given me a lot of insight about the other side, but not just from him, but from so many I talk to on that side. And by the way, the books um, that are being written now about near-death experiences, kind of like uh, Evan Alexander's, there's mm-hmm. a wonderful new book out that just came out by Lynn, uh, Lynn Russell from Canada, The Wonder of You, and she's done all this research with people and their near-death experiences and what they tell you about the afterlife, you can't put the book down. It is wow. so good. You just will love it because she puts them in categories of experiences that people have had um, that are similar. And uh, she worked with oh, a well-known researcher. I can't remember his name right now. And um, then she did research on her own, and she sent me the manuscript before it was completed, and I said... You have got a great book there, and now the book's published, and it's just wonderful. But there are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people who've had near-death experiences remember them and share them, and the afterlife is totally different than we've been taught as children or brought up to believe by our churches. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I, not all. I, but. This is so wonderful because we basically we th- there hasn't been a caller. I've been watching the panel, <laughs> but we have it. We're we're winding down. We're winding down the hour. So I I like for you to share anything you like to share about the Locust Center. Um, in the last um thirty seconds we have before the the show. I don't want us to just cut off and. Okay. <laughs> well, I, okay. I will tell you that Logos, L-O-G-O-S, means the Word yeah. or the Christ. And um, so we, we got that, we were given that from Spirit, the name, the Logos Center. And okay. logoscenter.org, uh, people can get all the information about our work and can order our books or they can order them on Amazon. My husband has written eight books. He wrote Why Jesus Taught Reincarnation and the Edgar Casey Primer and just a whole bunch of books published by Bantam and other publishers. And we believe that we, and our our job is to help try to raise consciousness. And so that at Logos, that's what we do. We teach our children how to talk with God. We teach uh, people how to learn to listen and to trust their intuition because it's not one of their five senses. It's uh, 
And we have a free book you can download called The Power of the Subconscious uh, uh, Mind on our Anna, website. We're going we're gonna to get cut off in like 10 seconds. So what I'm going to say okay. is I do have the link on my website to go to, to, and also the link for your books. But what I'm going to do is say good night to everybody. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Anne. Love you. I'm honored. Thank you so much, Caroline. Okay. Good night. Good night.